Okay, so welcome everyone to Seed Saving for Ecological Restoration. Uh, my name is Tim Alamanchuk. I am a PhD student here and uh, also started the Waterloo Wildflower Seed Library, which uh, some of you might have received seeds. Uh, we mailed them out to folks who registered for this conference and we're in Ontario. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about seed saving generally for ecological restoration. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, I'm in Waterloo, Ontario. It's part of the Haldeman Tract. Uh, which was given to the Haudenosaunee in honor of their uh, alliance with the British in the uh, American War of Independence. The land was also previously stewarded by the Anishinaabe, and it was also previous to them stewarded by the neutral, who uh, were called the neutral by the Jesuits, they were called the Attawandaran by the Wendat, and uh, some records suggest that they called themselves the Chonantan, which means uh, people who keep deer. Uh, so I acknowledge that all of those stewards came before and still live on this land today. And when we're talking about doing restoration work, it's really important to consider not just the indigenous history of the land, but the modern indigenous realities on the land. Um, the map that I'm showing you shows the former Haldeman Tract, which has been shrunk to uh, Six Nations Reserve, which is a tiny postage stamp piece of what used to uh, be the um, territory of the Haudenosaunee. So I just think it's important to start there and keep that in mind. Um, I told you a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm a PhD student here at University of Waterloo. I'm in Steve Murphy's Conservation and Restoration Ecology Lab. Uh, some of you might know Steve. He's a great guy and a great advisor. Uh, and I'm always covered in dirt. I love to be outside. I love to be working on different projects. Uh, I'm sure I've worked on projects with some of the folks who are on this call right now. This picture here is where I'm from. I was born in Elliott Lake, Ontario, which is in northern Ontario. It's about two hours from Sudbury. Uh, I was born there. I didn't spend very much time there. I grew up mostly in Kitchener, but I still have family in Elliott Lake, and it's still a place when I think about my connection to place that is very close to my heart. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is seed collecting and uh, seed storage and growing plants from seed. Now, why is it important to talk about seeds? This is the Tallgrass Prairie ecosystem. This one is just outside of uh, Brantford. It is uh, a beautiful ecosystem full of a diversity of native wildflowers and grasses. Tallgrass Prairie used to be very prominent all in Waterloo and in this area. Um, this is what exists of the Tallgrass Prairie today. Just 1% of the remnant tall grass prairie still exists today. The rest has been taken over uh, by agriculture, by development, uh, by golf courses, lots and lots of golf courses. So by saving seeds, we can do our part to help keep some of these plants alive and to bring them back to the landscapes that have been colonized and taken over and replaced with hostas. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about the whole spectrum of seed skills. Uh, we're going to talk about how you go about collecting seeds. Uh, this is a workshop I love to do in person, but we can't do that right now. So hopefully we'll have a chance to do it in person in the near future. We're going to talk about storing seeds, best practices for keeping your seeds dry and making sure that they can be germinated long into the future. And then we're going to talk a little bit about growing seeds. I'm going to go through some of the top high level best practices when you're trying to grow plants from seed, grow native plants specifically. Um, so when we talk about native plants, just for the benefit of all who are on this call, we're talking about a very specific type of plant. Native plants have grown in this area for thousands of years. They're adapted to the local soil and weather conditions, and most importantly, the local insects recognize them. They feed on them, they nest on them. A lot of you are probably familiar with milkweed. It's famously associated with monarch butterflies. There are lots of other butterflies who have plant-specific associations, like the swallowtail butterfly prefers golden alexanders or things in the parsley family. So it's really important for us to keep these native plants alive. Non-native plants, in contrast, are new to this area. They're typically the ones that are sold by the horticulture industry. So if this is your first kind of encounter in the native plant world, a lot of the plants that you might have grown up knowing about or seeing in gardens, those are not native to, to Canada. Uh, they were brought in by the horticulture industry. So things like uh, hostas are very, very popular, but those are actually from China, from rainforest areas in China. Uh, and they were brought over as like a horticultural uh, novelty. They happen to live and thrive 
but the local insects don't recognize or use these plants. Um, so to illustrate that, I've put a few photos of native and non-native plants. And I know that a lot of folks on this call might be from the Faculty of Environment, and this is really, really basic stuff, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so native plants along the top, we have butterfly milkweed, we have tall anemone, we have zigzag goldenrod, uh, we have wild bergamot, and we have dense blazing star going from left to right on my screen. And then on the bottom, we have plants like lily of the valley, non-native, very invasive, uh, Russian sage, hostas, which I've mentioned, uh, Japanese knotweed, which is also non-native and invasive, and then we have tiger lily, which is non-native and it can escape. Uh, so when I'm talking about saving seeds, we're saving them from the plants that are like the ones on the top row. There are thousands of different types of native plants. There's much more than just these five. So one of the ways we know why they're important is because some scientists have done the work of counting insects that feed on native plants. These two charts are from the work of Doug Tallamy. He's a famous entomologist, one of the big stars of the native plant movement. Uh, and really what you need to look at here is the difference in numbers. So native plants like goldenrod and asters and sunflowers will support 115, 112, 73 different species of Lepidoptera, which is butterflies. Um, now, non-native plants, they don't support nearly as much. You can see there Phragmites, which is a very invasive reed, only supports five species of herbivores that are native to North America, compared with 170 in its home range. It's been here for 300 years. So some people argue that insects will adapt to non-native plants, but this research shows that that's not really the case. We need to keep planting native plants. So when we're talking about collecting seed, the reasons to collect it are, of course, to grow native plants, to help with restoration. But one of the big reasons why I talk about seed so much and why I care about seed is because it's very accessible. It is very easy for you to go and collect seed. It is comparably more difficult to be able to grow and give people plants. Uh, they're much bigger, they're much heavier, they require much more work. So seeds are this nice compact way that you can say, hey, here is like a small bag that contains a tall grass prairie for 400 square feet of prairie. Uh, I have here a picture of black walnuts that a squirrel has been saving up for uh, for the winter time. Those are seeds as well, tree seeds. Uh, we won't talk about tree seeds in depth today, but uh, if there are any questions about tree seeds, I could talk about that as well. That's a, a fun subject. Um, so how do you collect seed? Some uh, seeds are important to the ecosystem itself. So it's important to be really careful where you're collecting seed from and not just go into the wild and harvest every single seed that you see. Uh, the first step is to make permission or find or get permission or find somewhere that is a public area, a public woodlot or something like that. The second step is to make sure that you have a proper ID on the plant. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the best time to collect seed. It's in the fall. Uh, the trick with most plants, though, is that they don't quite look the same in the fall. They might be dried or desiccated, and, and you have trouble IDing them again. So it's really crucial to make sure you get a proper identification, uh, especially if you're planning to give the seed to somebody. If you identify something as, um, you know, blue stem goldenrod, but it's actually Canada goldenrod, uh, somebody putting that in their garden might be a little upset because Canada goldenrod is quite aggressive and will take over. And when you're harvesting, try to make sure you don't take uh, more than about 10% of what's there. It's a really tough guideline to follow because it's hard to look at a field of flowers and say, what is 10%? But you should just try to think like, am I taking more than 10% or am I within that safe range? And that's to leave a lot of seed for the birds to eat uh, and also to seed new plants for the next year. Uh, a lot of these native plants are perennial, so they'll come back from their rootstock, but it's good to have a seed bank so that the plants can expand in the area that they are. You can kind of use your judgment to figure out good places to harvest seed and not so good. A garden that's surrounded by uh, grass and roads and so on and so forth the seeds that are in that garden only travel about 500 meters on average so you can feel free to harvest a lot of that seed because it's going to land on grass and get mowed or it's going to land on the road and go away but if you're looking at a native prairie like they have at rare in cambridge um, that seed's going to be viable and germinate and keep that prairie living so don't 
take too, too much of it. Um, how do you know when a seed's good? I mentioned this a little bit. Uh, when the plant is dried out, so here I have some wild bergamot seed heads. Uh, the seeds in this plant are actually in those little tubes on the seed head. Uh, they, uh, you know it's ready because the flower is gone and it is dry and kind of brown. And so if I were collecting this seed, I would just snip off that head and put it in a bag. That won't harm the plant. The plant still gets energy from those leaves and it's at this stage in its life, concentrating its energy in the root system. So you're not harming it by taking the whole head uh, and it makes things a lot easier. Fall, as I mentioned, is a great time to collect seed. Uh, one of the ways you can think about this is uh, the life cycle of a plant starts with flowering and then the flowers become the seed. Uh, so if you look at these flower charts, this one is from Credit Valley Conservation, it'll tell you when the plant is flowering and you can pretty reliably judge that one or two months after it finishes flowering, it's going to have that dried seed head that you can collect from. Um, so you can see here on the top, the long fruited anemone flowers in June and July. Um, you might look in August or September just to see how it is and see if it's dried out and if the seed is, uh, is viable or not. And you know it's viable when the seed starts to come away from the plant freely, uh, if that makes sense. So something like this, you can see a bunch of dried seed heads in the front of this. This is that wild bergamot that we were talking about before. That stuff's good to collect, but you can notice in the far back left, there's brown-eyed Susans that still have yellow flowers. Those are not yet good to collect. Some of the brown-eyed Susans in this patch are ready because they have uh, lost their petals and they've turned into a dried out head. So that's kind of how you might recognize when it's good to collect. Uh, like I mentioned on the last slide too, if the seed is coming away freely in your hand, then it's good. So what I do with wild bergamot, and I'll show you how to process wild bergamot later, and this will make more sense, but I will tip that seed head upside down when it has those tubes, and I'll tap it on my hand and see if the seeds fall out. And if the seeds fall out, it's good to start collecting from that plant. So there's three main seed types when we talk about wildflowers. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about grasses in this. Uh, grasses are kind of their whole universe and they have a somewhat easier seed to collect. Uh, but when we're talking about wildflowers, there's three main types. There's ones where they store the seed in tubes, uh, which is called a calyx, and that is the uh, wild bergamot. It's also a Virginia mountain mint, stores its seed in little tubes like that. Um, the second type is fluff. So these are your milkweeds, goldenrod has a fluff, the dense blazing star has a fluff. It's any seed that's wind dispersed and it has that tail. And then the third type is pods. Uh, and this is seeds. The main one for this is something called uh, showy tick trifoil, uh, Desmodium canadense. Sorry, that's Canada tick trifoil. And those come in tiny pods that stick to your clothing. So we're going to talk about how you prepare these seeds for storage and some of the principles around storing seeds. When you're storing seeds, you want them to be in a nice manageable condition. So I have right here a bunch of uh, brown-eyed Susan seeds. This is the equivalent of probably 30 or 40 flower seed heads that would be much more to store all those seed heads. So you want to try to make your seed as small as possible before you store it. That helps you find storage. It helps the seeds stay dry and stay viable. Um, so like I've said a couple times, you want to make sure the seed is dry when you harvest it. Dryness is really important. Uh, the basic principles when I think about seed storage is I think about what does a plant need to grow? A plant needs light, moisture and heat. So if you want the seed to not grow, you're storing it, you need to give it darkness, dryness and coolness. The exact opposite of what a plant needs to grow. Of those three, dryness is the most, most, most important. Uh, damp seeds can get mildew, they can maybe preemptively start to germinate. 
Uh, so they need time to dry out. And what I do is I use old yogurt tubs or containers and leave the seed heads out in an open container for a few days before processing. I live in a very dry apartment in Waterloo, so I'm lucky that way. If you're in a basement apartment, you might need to find a drier place to leave them. You can dry them outside, although there's always risk of rain and so on and so forth. Um, one thing to avoid is don't use a dehydrator. They get too hot for these seeds and they could kill the seed. So if you're ever in doubt on how to process or make the seeds smaller, just cut off the whole seed head and bring it home. And there are techniques to be able to um, clean those seeds. I know I showed my seed in a Ziploc bag. Uh, you should avoid Ziploc bags. Use paper to store your seeds. The reason why I can keep this in a Ziploc bag is because this is very dry seed. Uh, and I know that there's no moisture in this bag at all. So it's not going to get mildew or anything like that. But in the field, you can use Ziploc bags temporarily to hold your things uh, so that they don't get messy. Um, Specifically, I'm going to talk about how to clean different types of seeds and we'll go through these three types individually. This is again a lot more fun in person, so I appreciate everyone who's following along at home. Uh, but the best way for these tube seed heads is to put them into a bag uh, once they're dry and shake it and the seeds will fall to the bottom. So I have here some uh, wild bergamot seed heads. And you make sure there's air in the bag and you just shake it like that and you know you can see some stuff starting to fly around in there and i'm sure the webcam doesn't quite show this but if you look closely at the bottom there's tiny seeds starting to fall out so with enough shaking you can get to a point where you can pour those tiny seeds out and then you could use a sieve if you want to be really clean about it but uh, there's not really a need to make your seeds super super clean you're just trying to get most of the flower matter away from it so it's easier to store the second type of seed and the most annoying to clean is fluff uh milkweed anybody who's cleaned it is probably you know having flashbacks to just being covered in the fluff uh, there is one good way that I've found to do this, and that's using either leather or those heavy gardening gloves. Um, and you rub the seed between your hands and the seed will fall. So you have like a container and you can keep rubbing it and the fluff will eventually start to pill up and turn into like cottony kind of balls that you can pick off easier than this floating fluff. And you can use this method with any of the fluff seeds. I've done it on Joe Pie weed, which is a fluff seed. Um, you can do it on any of the milkweeds. I've also used it on bone set, on goldenrod, on dense blazing star. It's not perfect, but it does a really good job. And it's better than like sitting there and picking fluff off things one by one. The third type are these seeds in a pod. There isn't really a great way to do this. Um, the best way if you have a small amount is just to pop them out. Uh, I'm often asked the question like, do you need to do that or can you just plant the pod? And you do need to do that. The pod will take a couple of years to decompose. Uh, so it's important to pop them out individually and have your little seed. You can use a coffee grinder. I did this, you lose about 25% of the seed um, because the coffee grinder will cut the seed as well as the pod. But you can use a coffee grinder to break up those pods and then kind of pull the seed matter out of the bottom. Uh, the other thing to remember about seeds is that good seeds sink in water. So if you put your seed matter into a thing of soapy water, the seed will fall. And the reason why we use soap is to break the surface tension of the water. That's a really advanced cleaning method and not really something you need to do if you're just trying to get a few seeds or, or what have you. But if you wanted to do bulk processing, you could get into using a coffee grinder and things like that. And that's something I'm always happy to chat more about is, it, you know, if you have the energy and you want to collect hundreds and thousands of seeds and bulk process them, there are more efficient techniques. But for you in your home, if you get a bunch of these pods and you wanted to try growing some tick trifoil next year, you can just pop them out by hand. Um, yeah, so advanced seed cleaning. I mentioned some of this already. Sieves can be very useful. Uh, I use just a regular kitchen sieve. The Ecology Lab at U Waterloo has a bunch of soil screens that are amazing for this kind of thing uh, when they can get into it. 
uh, when we can get into the ecology lab, but those soil screens are hundreds of dollars for you to buy on your own. Um, if you want to get really ambitious about it, you can build what's called a CETA aspirator. Uh, there's one right behind me. This is the diagram for that. Uh, I just think this is really cool. Um, so it's basically a series of chambers. The seed goes down here and it bounces around and a vacuum goes in this side and the lighter material gets sucked out here and then the heavier seed falls to the bottom. Uh, it works really well. It's just you don't necessarily need to get your seed that clean. If there's a little bit of plant matter in with your seed, it's not going to affect the germination rate or anything like that. Uh, I just had some time and I like woodworking, so I figured I'd build one of those. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so when the time comes to store your seed, like I said before, uh, paper is the best way to store it. This is my seed shoe box on this slide. Um, I try to label each seed packet with where I collected it. The species name is most important. It is virtually impossible to tell some seed apart until you get really good and you're working with seeds all the time. Uh, but even some seeds like swamp milkweed versus butterfly milkweed versus common milkweed, you're going to want to keep those very well labeled. Um, and a fun reuse that you can do are these little packets of silica gel that I have on this slide. They come in a lot of consumer products. You'll find them in new shoes. You'll find them in some electronics. Uh, and what those are is a desiccant. That means that they absorb the moisture that's in anything. The reason why they put them in those project products is to keep the moisture away from your product. So to keep that dry. Um, I always save these packets. You can just throw that packet in the shoebox and it will absorb some of the moisture that's in there and help keep the seeds dry. Uh, it's a really great thing to do. Just an extra layer to ensure you're getting that dryness. You don't need to store your seeds in the fridge. Um, the germination rates tend to stay constant for the first year. If you're planning on keeping your seed after a year, then yes, you need to store it in somewhere cooler than your house. Uh, but about a year, you can just store it in a shoebox like I do in a dry area that is not, uh, that is somewhat cool. I keep this on a bookshelf, uh, you know, in my living room and it does just fine and the germination rates on the seeds are great. So when the time comes where you want to grow from seed, um, you're going to need to go through a couple steps. And folks who are new to native plants, this is one of the most difficult things to figure out in the beginning. Almost all native plant seeds need a period of cold, moist stratification. In nature, they get this through winter. This is an evolutionary adaptation to prevent the plant from germinating early. If plants germinate in the fall and then winter comes and it kills the plant, then there's no survival for the species. So these seeds have evolved to need a period of cold, moist temperatures. Most wildflowers and grasses need 30 days. Some need 60 or 90. Um, some need two periods of cold, moist stratification, but for the most part, 30 days works. Uh, you can look up your specific plant online, and I'll have some resources at the end of this slideshow uh, to find out the exact stratification time. Uh, this process is called stratification, this cold, moist temperature sequence. So you really have two options when you're going to grow native plants from seed. Option one is to use your fridge to simulate winter, not your freezer. Your fridge will do just fine. That's a fine, cool temperature. And option two is to let nature do the work. Uh, just plant your seeds out in the fall and expect that they won't uh, germinate until the following spring. So this is what it looks like when you use the fridge to simulate winter. Uh, I made a short video tutorial that explains how I put together a bag like this. But this is a, a seed mix that I'm preparing for the Working Center, Center's Market Garden Farm. They're putting in a couple pollinator strips and they asked me for some seeds, so I put together a seed mix. The way it works is you mix it with moist potting mix. The potting mix you want to get about the dampness of a damp wrung out sponge and you mix your seeds with that and then you put it in the fridge for about 30 days. I usually put them in at the beginning of February. So this bag is one that I did this year and I have that in the fridge right now. 
Um, and then it'll be ready to sow outdoors. And we're going to sow it into a plot that has been free of weeds. So this particular plot, we're going to be laying down new soil on top of uh, some mulch to make a kind of lasagna garden bed style. And we're going to seed it with this. But this is how you use your fridge to simulate winter. The video link I have in here, I'm not going to play it because playing video on Teams never really works well. Uh, but this slideshow will be shared with you after, and you're more than welcome to click on it. It explains in two minutes how I put this together. The easiest way though is to let nature do the work. And this is from my balcony. I have five different species that I sowed in plug trays. Uh, out on the balcony here and I put these when it was still sunny and there wasn't even snow on the ground. Uh, I maybe jumped the gun on that a little bit, but it doesn't matter because they would do this in nature anyways. So we're just recreating the conditions that exist in nature. Um, so these are all going to sprout in the spring, hopefully, and then I can plant them out at the various pollinator gardens or community groups that I work with. Um, they can have access to these plants for free, but it's a really low maintenance way. I don't water these. I don't do anything with them. I just make sure that they're still there and, you know, they haven't gotten knocked over by the wind. Uh, it's super easy. So there's a few things that people always ask me about that people always attempt uh, that I wanted to address before they come up. Uh, one thing is people think they can scatter wildflower seed in kind of abandoned lots and improve the ecological integrity. Tends not to work. Uh, one of the main reasons is that invasive species like garlic mustard are what we call allopathic. They'll actually prevent the germination of other seeds. So you need to eradicate weeds or, or get, get as weed free as you possibly can before you do this planting. Um, the second thing is some people just plant in the spring and hope for the best. Some of the seeds will germinate this way. About 40% of milkweed seeds are viable without stratification. But really, the best thing to do is to stratify them and you get full germination. Um, and some people will just scatter the seed in the empty garden, but it's really, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure that it is very weed free. Um, you won't be able to tell the difference between a weed or an invasive plant when it's young and a native wildflower. It's, it's really tough to tell which is which. And so weeding after your seeds are germinating is really difficult. Uh, you're better off doing it beforehand, clearing out all of those weeds before you plant the native wildflowers. Um, so I have some further resources here, uh, Grand River Conservation, Credit Valley Conservation, and a really good list of establishing native prairies and meadows. Uh, this will be shared with you after on the slideshow, so don't worry about these super long links. Um, but that's all my knowledge on seeds that I thought to uh, to give to you. And, and hopefully that has filled in some gaps or helped you understand how to work with native seeds a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to stop my screen share in one minute and open the floor for questions. So if folks wanted to take down my email, I am always happy to talk about native plants or seeds. I don't know if you could tell, this is a big part of my life. I'm very enthusiastic about it. Um, I can, you know, I'm always happy to help if it's supplying seeds or advice or labor on a project you're working on. Uh, I am always interested in hearing about that. So definitely do uh, email me if you have any questions or want to chat further. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can kind of see things and open it up for questions. Uh, I would invite anyone to uh, to just unmute themselves and ask freely. I see a couple. Yeah, I just want to. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, I just want to ask a question about um, germinating Canada red bud seeds. I tried to collect some the other day, and I usually start mine in a plastic bag with a piece of paper towel, and they let them sprout from there. But which has worked for all the other seeds I've tried, but they, within a day or two, all got moldy. Um, and I tried it two different times. So I was wondering if there's a different approach I should be taking for these seeds that would be better. Yeah. Uh, so red bud needs fire to germinate. <laughs> that um, would be why. <laughs> it needs to be boiled actually is the way that um, okay. that the tree people I know do it. Uh, so you can kind of look up online uh, the, the amount of time, but I don't think it's very long. I think you just kind of put them in boiling water for a few minutes. Um, but uh, if, if you can't find it online, uh, there is a book 
that is by the one of the people who ran the Guelph Arboretum that is has tree seeds in the name. Uh, I can look it up and send it to you after, Shane, uh, but it is at the library at UW and it has exact specifications on how to grow red bud from seed. But yeah, you need to heat them. Great, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so Natalia asked vacuum pack with a question mark. Uh, Natalia, was that, are you asking, should you vacuum pack the seeds? Yeah, I asked it when you were talking about packing it. I thought if you remove the air, will it be like best? And it also saves a lot of space this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't seen any research on that. Um, like I mentioned, the germination rates stay good for about a year. Uh, so unless you're looking at ultra long term storage, um, maybe vacuum packing would work, but uh, I personally don't have experience of, with it. Um, if you're looking at ultra long-term storage, Seeds of Diversity does this. Uh, they store their seeds, once they're completely dry, in mason jars sealed in the fridge, and they get you know years and years of good life out of them. Uh, so in terms of whether it would be worth the effort to vacuum pack it, I don't I don't really think unless you wanted to save the seed, you know, for decades or something like that, uh, then maybe it's something to look into. Thank you. And I also had an idea, like remember you were talking uh, about breaking the pods on the seed? Mm -hmm. uh, you can use a coffee grinder. I just thought about the food processor. There's like emulsifying discs. What they do is like they hit it really hard and that's about it. So there is no, do you think it's a good idea to, I just had an idea. I just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it just kind of hits it really hard. So technically it will crush the pod, but it will not break the seed. That's a great idea. Um, I think that would work very well. What? So Mary Gartshore is a woman who runs a big uh, native seed farm in southwestern Ontario. And what she uses for a lot of her crushing is uh, she gets old blenders and she covers the blade in garden hose, like cut open rubber garden hose zip tied on. Uh, and that makes them crush it instead of cutting the seeds. So I imagine your food processor uh, emulsifier attachment would work just fine. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Uh, and I see one in the chat from Nikita for the container planting in the winter. Should they be sheltered or just let the snow and everything get on them? Um, let the snow and everything get on them. That helps keep the moisture up. The only thing is uh, some people will put a screen over top, uh, either like a vinyl screen or a metal mesh or something to prevent birds or squirrels from eating them. Uh, what I use is um, vermiculite. It's a volcanic rock that is really lightweight and, and you kind of sprinkle it on top so the seed can still get out and germinate, but it provides a little bit of extra protection. Um, so if you do want to shelter it, you should use something that's porous that's going to let like rain and snow through, but will protect it from animals because animals are probably your biggest concern, like birds eating it or squirrels digging it up, uh, especially if you were planting acorns or anything that is like delicious to a squirrel, they will dig it up. They will find it anywhere. You're welcome. Hi, I had a question. Sure. Um, so this isn't necessarily about the seeds that you talked about, but I'm just curious if you know the answer. Um, earlier this year, I grew two stalks of corn in my dorm room. And for the most part, it was successful. But when it came to developing the flowers needed for pollination, they didn't develop properly. And I was just wondering if you had any clues to why that was, because everything else grew totally fine. Interesting. Hmm. Um, wow, corn's a big plant to grow in your room. <laughs> my guess would be, I mean, either not enough nutrients or not enough sunlight. I don't know what your setup is, but corn takes a significant amount of light and of nutrients. Uh, was it, yeah, the, the person who just mentioned in the chat with the blue red light ratio be a thing like, does, does your room have, are you using natural light or artificial light? 
Uh, the way my dorm room set up, I get a lot of sunlight, so it was all natural light. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sometimes what we think is a lot of sunlight is not much for a plant because they're used to growing with like 360 degrees of sunlight. Um, it's, and corn in particular is a very intensive plant, it takes a lot of sun energy and a lot of nutrients from the soil. So I would imagine that uh, not having enough of one of those two things. Um, I'm surprised that it developed, did it develop cobs or it didn't even, it didn't flower. So I guess it wouldn't have, right? Um, it did actually like start to develop cobs. I ended up with like six of them, but they were really, really tiny. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, corn's also wind pollinated, so it would need to be pollinated, I think, from from outside somehow. Yeah, I looked up like online ways to like do it yourself and that kind of stuff. So I tried that, but I just like the flowers just didn't fully develop, I guess. Sorry, I know that's a very off-topic random question. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll, uh, it, it's good to think about these things. I have a really good friend who's uh, an agriculture person who runs the working center garden. Uh, I just offload all my agriculture questions to him so I don't have to think about it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions about seeds or other things restoration related? All right. Well, seeing none, I'm going to stop recording. Oh, sorry.